Family Papers, A Sephardic Journey Through the 20th Century is a book that seeks to tell the history of a single family over the arc of a generation and across the globe um, between all of the emigre destinations that this family settled in after leaving their homeland of what was once Ottoman Salonika, today Thessaloniki, Greece. And while it tells the history of a single family, it also seeks to reconstruct the story of the papers, especially the letters that they exchanged across the many boundaries and the vast turmoil that divided them, and that ultimately proved a crucial glue in holding the family together. The family at the heart of family papers, the Levy family, is a family of printers and writers and publishers, uh, teachers, community leaders, um, journalists, and businessmen and businesswomen. They were united not only by blood or uh, belief, but by the papers that they exchanged and that bound them together, and by a shared fidelity to history. The Levy family followed the broad template of modern Jewish history in many regards, but one of the things that made them unique was they were part of a cultural group that was helping to change Sephardic culture, to modernize Sephardic culture. Their origin point is the city of Ottoman Salonika, which at the time that my book begins, in the early 19th century, was one of the few cities in the modern Jewish world to have a Jewish majority. By the late 19th century, Jews represented 60,000 of 100,000 of Salonika's residents, forming an influential part of the cultural fabric of this multi-ethnic, multi-sectarian, multilingual city. Salonika was a port town, it was an important town, to the Ottoman Empire, but it was also a pivotal cultural center for the Sephardic world of Southeastern Europe, the Judeo-Spanish or Ladino-speaking heartland of Europe. So as a historian, my job is to ferret out documents of the past that have not been examined before and that give voice to people's histories that might be lost to the historical record. In this respect, it's very significant that I found my way to this family by reconstructing in reverse the voyage of a single document. That single document is the memoir of the family patriarch, Sadi Veselel Ashkenazi Alevi, which was dictated to a scribe written in Salatreya, which is the unique Ladino handwritten cursive written over a period of years in the mid to late 19th century. It was written in a very slender, inexpensive, and incredibly flimsy notebook. And this notebook undertakes an extraordinary journey from Ottoman Salonika to Paris, to Rio de Janeiro, to Jerusalem, to an archive where it is in fact miscatalogued and lost for many years until it is found again by my colleague and friend Erin Rodrigue with whom I sought to translate it into English and to present it not only to an English language reading audience, but also to present it as a language study tool in its original Salatreo, in transliterated Ladino, and masterfully with a translation by Isaac Drusalmi in English. This object, which had undertaken such an extraordinary journey, I was able to follow backwards and to each place that this flimsy notebook had landed, I was able to reconstruct chapters of the family history and ultimately to open the door to living members of the family and to the papers that they continued to steward, which themselves told a history of the family dating back generations and over a century. The third generation of the Levy family, whose history I follow in a lot of detail, begins to pass away in the 1960s and 1970s. These were members of the family and the last generation of the family who had all been born in Salonika before their emigration in so many directions. And I chart that transformation in a chapter I title Leon, the cousins, all grandchildren of Sadi Besalel Ashkenazi Alevi had lived under Ottoman, Greek, German, French, Spanish, Portuguese, British, Indian, and Brazilian rule. They had witnessed the 1917 fire in Salonika, 
the Balkan Wars, the First and Second World Wars, and they had emigrated in multiple directions, some more than once. When Saadi died in 1903, his grandchildren were mostly old enough to carry memories of this old world figure into the late 20th century. Their own children grew up in a global diaspora with no one speaking Ladino, the family's historic mother tongue. In this quotation, what I am really trying to grapple with is the compression of change experienced by this family and by Sephardic culture within the relatively dense seven decades of the 20th century, from the turn of the century to the 1970s. I explore earlier periods and later periods in the book, but here we have such a staggering multi-generational sequence of change. Change that marked uh, the fragmentation of the Sephardic world, and also that fragmented historic centers of Jewish culture like Salonika. Of course, this was true of the Ashkenazi world as well, but also true of the Sephardi world. So if we think that in the course of that time period, within one family, we can travel from a man who is born in the Ottoman environment, who represents the Ottoman Empire as an official, I'm thinking here of the figure of Daoud Effendi, who represents his community through the interwar period. He will be deported to Auschwitz, where he is among the oldest members of his community to perish. And still within this very short period of time, we can trace his children leaving home, the adoption of new languages and cultures and sometimes religions. And this journey takes us to a point by the end of the next generation that this family is in diaspora from each other, barely in touch, barely aware of one another and not speaking that historic mother tongue. So the the breadth of change, the rapidity of change is so astonishing and can be captured in really individual lives and also the life of a family. So often histories of the Holocaust emphasize the European and Ashkenazi Jewish experience and Sephardic experiences of the Holocaust are left out of that story. But the Jewish community of Salonika and the Jews of Greece more generally experience some of the highest rates of annihilation of any single Jewish community in Europe. The numbers of the annihilated were of course far greater in places like Warsaw, where there were so many more Jews to begin with, but by percentage, the Salonikan and Greek Jewish communities were decimated in among the highest percentages that historians can reconstruct. The Levy family experienced this trauma in various locations. There were some in emigre destinations, especially Paris, who were present for the occupation of the German army and Nazi representatives. Some of those Family members managed to flee to the South and survive in hiding. Others remained in Paris during occupation and would be deported from Paris to the temporary internment site of Drancy and from there to Auschwitz, where most would perish, although one then survived in a labor camp. Some members of the family, of course, were outside the Nazi dragnet in Brazil, in Portugal, in England in the course of the war but most of the family members were still in Salonika. They were present for the Nazi occupation of the city, and they were also present for the incredible famine that unfolded in this area in the course of the war, due largely to the systematic stripping of Greece, first by the Italians and then by the Germans of foodstuffs. They were also present, of course, for the horrific moment of forced labor, forced humiliation, the imposition of the Nuremberg Laws, the erection of ghettos in the city of Salonika, and ultimately for so-called selection and deportation to death camps in the East. The majority of Jews of Salonika will perish in the gas chambers of Auschwitz, and among them will be members of four generations of this family, um, very few survive. Shortly after the German occupation of Salonika, the occupying authorities undertake a systematic pillaging of the community's assets, of property, 
of precious items, but also of libraries, of Torah scrolls, of material objects found within synagogues and homes. All measure of property that was, of course, stripped from Jewish communities across Europe. In his very late years, one member of the family, Daut Effendi, who had served as the interwar chancellor of the Jewish community, is charged with the task of accounting for all the property owned by the Jewish community in a document that will be utilized by the Nazis to steal this property. It is, however, astonishing that before his deportation to Auschwitz, again, this is in his, um, his eighth decade of life, he manages to hide a copy of this list, and it will only be found very recently uh, by the community, and to this day continues to be a template for the reconstruction of what was stolen and what might be reclaimed. The family, of course, suffered more private and personal losses of objects, the raising of burial plots of family members to which they had returned ritualistically and routinely over many, many generations, all raised when the Jewish cemetery of Salonika was raised by the Greek municipality in the course of war. Along with so much else is lost precious documents of the family, homes, interiors of homes, collected art. The family speaks especially mournfully about the loss in earlier moments of Turkish rugs that they had preserved as a kind of inheritance for their family. Those that perhaps were not already lost would be, of course, further destroyed along with so much of the private property of, of the Jewish community. So vast quantities of materials, precious items are lost. And the family, in seeking restitution and reclamation of property and materials subsequently, will find it almost impossible to recover. I will note one interesting fact about the Salonican Jewish community is that the papers of this community get scattered in the near end of the war, with some being taken to the Soviet Union, some being taken to the United States, some being taken to France and other destinations, so that the very archive, the very documentary trail of families like the Levies and of the Salonican Jewish community as a whole is forcibly dispersed. And therefore, it falls to the historian or the genealogist to, in a sense, reunite the family, to tell its story by reuniting these forcibly scattered documents. When it came to investigating the history of the Levy family, I used many of the skills that are in the toolkit of the historian, which is seeking out documents like this around the world in archives and in libraries. But what was crucial and unique for me as a scholar in writing this book was that the research also hinged on the openness of the family as it exists today. Their openness to meeting me, to welcoming me into their homes, to sharing with me materials that the family had preserved, extraordinary materials, not only written documents, but paraphernalia of, of all varieties, including some objects of material culture, that they continue to cherish as a kind of inheritance and which they very generously availed to me, came to be crucial for me as I wrote this book. I expected, of course, to uncover tremendous trauma while researching the Levy family because so much trauma was uh, present for the Jewish community of Salonika. What I was not prepared to discover is that a member of the family was a Nazi abetter, the head of the Jewish police, Nazi appointed head of the Jewish police of Salonika, the Judenrat, a man by the name of Vital Hassan, who was a notorious sadist and who subsequently in many, many testimonies in Ladino, in Greek, in Hebrew, in French, by survivors would subsequently be accused of absolutely horrific crimes. For these crimes, Vital Hassan would be tried in the immediate post-war period by the Greek state at the behest of the Jewish community. He would be found guilty of the crime of abetting the Nazis, and he would be sentenced to death and executed. He is, by my estimation, the only Jew in all of Europe to be tried by a state at the behest of a Jewish community and to be executed for such a crime. 
We tend to think of letters as being important for the content that they convey, and indeed for the Levy family that exchanged letters over such a long swath of time and across so many miles. Of course, for them, content was crucial. But from my eyes, the form of these letters is also very arresting. Often they emerged for me as extraordinary objects of material history that um, required scrutiny, not just for the words they held, but, but for their form. One letter in particular that I remember so vividly is a letter by Vida Alevi, written in Vida's voice, but by the hand of her daughter, Eleanor, from her home of Salonica to her emigre son, Leon, in Rio de Janeiro. And this letter is a plea for financial support at a time at which the family was suffering broadly from the Great Depression and from the crisis that plagued the Salonican economy in the interwar period, and also more specifically from a family economic calamity that had brought them a kind of reversal of economic fortune. Now, this letter written in Ladino would be poignant enough uh, just for its content. But one of the ways it is a particularly remarkable historical document is that it is stained with tears. Whose tears I do not know, if they were Vida's herself, the tears of her son reading this tragic missive in far off Rio de Janeiro, or the tears of a subsequent generation trying to reconstruct its family past. But what those marks teach us is that sometimes to reconstruct the history of women, and the history of those left out of the historical record. We have to not only read the words of historical documents, but read around them. So many of the documents that the Levy family has preserved continue to remain in family hands, although it was necessary to supplement those materials with items that I found in archives and libraries around the world. It is an interesting twist of fate, I would say, with the publication of my book, Family Papers, that materials that were private reached the public realm. And in reaching the public realm, through my interpretation and narrativization and the publication of this book, in turn circled back and I think it's fair to say changed the, the private lives, the intimate lives of the family itself. And what I mean by that is this, that in the course of my research, I noticed that the dispersed members of this extended family were hesitant, indeed reluctant, to make contact with one another across the many divides that separated them. And yet with the publication of the book, with the recapturing of their shared story, the family has again brokered connection, has become a family after ceasing to be a family for a couple of generations, a few generations. And I was honored in the course of pandemic to join a Zoom family reunion of um, a crossing, I think it was four countries, uh, many branches of the family. These are people who never thought of themselves as family before the publication of my book, Family Papers, but who feel united by their shared history. So it is an example of the complex circularity between what is private and what is public, uh, what is scholarship and what is intimate, uh, and of the importance ultimately of telling history.